Chamber. Um, uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion 17011 in the name of Alison Johnson on addressing Scotland's GP recruitment and reten retention challenges. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Alison Johnson to speak to and move the motion. Eight minutes please Ms Johnson. Thank you presiding officer. I don't think that anyone in this chamber would deny that Scotland's GPs are facing considerable pressures at the moment. These pressures impact practitioner well-being, but they also have huge ramifications for the recruitment and retention of GPs. The results of a survey commissioned by the Royal College of General Practitioners in 2018 revealed that over a quarter of GPs are unlikely to be working in general practice in Scotland in five years' time. And of those who reported to be likely to leave general practice in the next five years, one in three said it was because it was too stressful. Now, these figures are a stark warning that Scotland's GP workforce is teetering on a cliff edge. I recognise that, that the Scottish Government has taken steps to tackle recruitment issues, such as the new GP contract, initiatives such as ScotGem, and increased training places, and I applaud those efforts. However, retention must be urgently addressed. We must take care of those who are already on the front line, or we may struggle to retain the workforce we have. The chair of the BMA's Scottish General Practitioners Committee, Dr Andrew Buist, said that the contract was aimed at making general practice more attractive, but noted that, of course, these deep-seated problems, such as there simply not being enough GPs, were never going to be solved in a single year. So this poses the question, how can we make things better for GPs while changes are being implemented? Now, I acknowledge that the expansion of practice teams is a means of lessening GP workload as other health professionals will now be delivering aspects of patient care that were previously the responsibility of GPs, such as vaccinations and pharmacotherapy. However, it will take time to grow and develop these teams. Extra strain, too, is placed on GPs when patients aren't informed of changes. I've previously mentioned in this chamber the fact that 35 of those surveyed by RCGP spent consultation time explaining to patients why they'd been offered appointments with other healthcare professionals instead of a GP. This places strain on GPs and patients who GPs report are becoming distressed, confused and angry at times. So I urge the Scottish Government to hold a national conversation on changes to services to relieve that burden on practice teams who are having to deliver the message and... You know, this must be an urgent priority for the government and I'm very happy to work with the Cabinet Secretary on what form any information campaign might take. The GP contract acknowledges that speed is not the only aspect of access that matters to people and that being able to see a practitioner of choice also matters to some groups. It's therefore extremely important that patients are still able to see a GP when they need to and that the workforce is in place to enable this to happen. However, the same RCGP survey showed that if those that were likely to be working in general practice in one year, 20% expected to work reduced hours. So this represents a culture change within general practice, as there's been a continued decrease in the proportion of GPs working eight or more sessions per week, from 51% in 2013 to 37% in 2017. So given the stressful working conditions already mentioned, and the fact that GPs frequently report working 12 or more hour days, this change is understandable. And until an appropriate workforce is in place to support this change, patients might find that they are waiting longer and longer to see a doctor. It is significant that the 2017-18 Health and Social Care Experience Survey showed that the percentage of respondents who highly rated the arrangements to see a doctor was 67%, and that's compared to 81% in 2009 10 now, the Scottish Government has pledged to provide an extra 800 GPs over the next 10 years, and I welcome this commitment. However, this figure refers to headcount only. RCGP estimates that Scotland will be short 856 whole-time equivalent GPs by 2021. So the Government's pledge falls short of what is needed, and I therefore urge the Cabinet Secretary to introduce more ambitious recruitment targets in line with the Royal College's recommendations. The Royal College also says that there's a serious funding deficit for general practice. And general practice carries out the vast majority of patient contact within the NHS. So given that Scotland has an ageing population, 
and GPs are seeing patients with increasingly complex health conditions, it is perhaps surprising that RCGP's latest figures show that general practice receives just 7.35% of Scottish NHS funding, falling well behind the average funding of general practice in the UK, which currently stands at 8.8%. So RCGP have consistently called for it to receive 11% of the NHS budget and ask supported by the BMA. This would represent approximately a 1% rise every year for three years. Now, the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan stated that the primary care workforce is uniquely placed to influence the level of demand for other care settings and listed cost effectiveness as one of the many benefits of strengthening primary care. Investment in general practice is therefore an investment in Scotland's entire healthcare system. You know, investing in, in general practice is investing in preventative measures. Lack of access to primary care often results in patients seeking assistance at hospitals. A better equipped, well-funded general practice would be able to relieve some of the strain on busy A&E departments and beyond. And one of the aims of health and social care integration is to shift care towards preventative and community-based services. Why then is proportional investment in general practice consistently below what is needed? The Royal College say that this investment would result in an increased GP workforce, modernised fit-for-purpose surgeries, widened access to training and improved IT systems. In short, the resources needed to support integration and for GPs to continue to deliver the very best standards of care for patients in Scotland. And funding must also be targeted to tackle health inequalities. Scotland still has one of the lowest life expectancies in Western Europe, and there have been concerns expressed by GPs that no extra funding has been allocated to those practices serving the most deprived populations in Scotland. Affluent practices with the most elderly patients continue to receive the highest GP funding per patient per annum. RCGP has called for additional GP clinical capacity with appropriate funding for areas of high deprivation. For recognition of the specific workload associated with socio-economic deprivation and for community link workers to be prioritised for practices in those areas of high deprivation. I will. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, will the member recognise, as the BMA does, that the new contract is in fact weighted towards, in terms of how the funding is allocated, areas of social deprivation and areas, i.e. those practices, which care, which care in particular for the elderly. Thank you. Ms Johnson, please move towards <coughs> closing. Um, I appreciate that every member of Scotland's population has an entitlement to the very best of care, but the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, and the debate will, will emphasise this, that I'm sure that there are still concerns around particular areas of the contract. This is a concern that's been expressed to me by GPs. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, with proper funding and a bolstered workforce, general practice can make significant strides in tackling health inequalities, lessening the strain on other NHS services and continuing to provide excellent care to Scotland's population. Thank you. I don't know if you moved your motion, Ms Johnson, did you um, move I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Jean Freeman to speak and move Amendment 17011.3. Cabinet Secretary, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about the significant progress that is being made to reform primary care and general practice, and also to acknowledge the challenges that we continue to face. Over 90% of healthcare in Scotland starts and stays in primary care. It is a vital part of our health service, and I know that everyone in this chamber offers our thanks to the staff across the many different professions who deliver these indispensable services day in, day out in every community in Scotland. We are working hard to deliver our strong commitment to primary care, but there are challenges and I am keenly focused on these. It is important to recognise that these challenges are not only the recruitment and retention of GPs, but also the recruitment and retention of the wider primary care team with all the multidisciplinary skills that patients need them to have. The guiding principle is the right one, that people should see the right healthcare professional at the right time in a way that suits them. 
These new teams, including practice and district nurses, health visitors, pharmacists, allied health professionals, mental health professionals and link workers, enhance patient care, provide the support for our GPs that they need and deliver on that guiding principle. The new GP contract has been in place for one year. It is a landmark contract, Scotland's first, and was developed and negotiated in partnership with the BMA and received a 71% support from their members. Increased business risk and workload were identified as key reasons stopping people wanting to be GPs and encouraging them to leave the profession prematurely. So the new contract works to reduce risks around premises and staffing. And the creation of those multidisciplinary teams of healthcare professionals works to ensure that the GP's workload is focused on those patients where the GP's particular clinical skills are the ones that are needed. The new GP contract in its wider sense and in its critical application sits at the core of our reform of primary care and central to the new contract is developing the leadership role of GPs locally. This includes the development of locally agreed primary care improvement plans covering all 31 uh, integration authorities. Yes? Neil Finlay. What does the Minister say to my constituents in Stonyburn who now no longer have any GP practice for the first time since the creation of the NHS in 1948? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I actually met uh, representatives of the Community Council uh, at the start of the Easter recess and was able to uh, assist them in some way in order to make sure that some of the services that they're concerned about uh, could uh, be made available to them in a sustainable way and I'll continue to monitor and secure that engagement um, the, for the, exactly for those purposes. Um, all GPs, urban and rural, need to see the benefits of the new contract, that it brings reduced business risk, improves workload and critically delivers the right care a patient needs from the right health professional and how services are delivered should fit local circumstances. The scope of local flexibility in the national contract is a central part of the work we've commissioned in the working group chaired by Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie. And we've asked that working group to agree exactly what that scope is. This involves the BMA, representatives of rural health boards and integration authorities, and critically, critically rural GPs. We're investing substantial sums in our reforms of primary care and general practice. And by the end of this parliament, we will have committed to increase annual expenditure on primary care by 500 million pounds a year, with 250 million of that increase invested in direct support for general practice. I know that while we have a focus on developing the multidisciplinary teams, we need to deliver that we need to deliver, I don't have time, I'm sorry, that we need to deliver enhanced services. We also need more GPs. We've committed to recruit at least 800 more GPs by 2028. We need to train, recruit and retain. Between 2015-16 and 2020-21, the Scottish Government will have increased medical places in Scottish universities by 190 uh, places, with the majority focused on primary care. These include ScotGem and 60 additional places for the academic year 1920 at Aberdeen and Glasgow. We've set up bursaries for harder to fill posts, which have seen a steady increase from 60 in 2017 to 101 in 2018. And we're taking specific steps to improve recruitment and retention of GPs in remote and rural communities. Last April, we published the first ever primary care focused workforce plan. We introduced and expanded practical services aimed at supporting GPs, including coaching and mentoring, and in the area of rural uh, GPs, uh, uh, special financial packages to encourage uh, relocation and to encourage retention. We've developed a targeted GP recruitment marketing campaign and at the RCGP conference last year, we addressed another practical problem they had raised with us when I launched the national GP recruitment website, gpjobs.scot, and we'll work to ensure that all existing vacancies are picked up and advertised there. So on that commitment of increasing the number of GPs, we're seeing early signs of success 
with latest figures indicating a record number of GPs working in Scotland. The GP headcount in 2018 was 4,994, 70 more than the year before. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I believe all of the actions I've outlined and the others time prevents me from covering are the right ones for us to take. But I am also listening to primary care professionals, to patients and to members of this chamber. If there are more steps to be taken to ensure that these essential services are not only protected but help to flourish, then we will take them. I know that across the chamber we all recognise enhanced primary care services with general practice at the heart of them is the bedrock of the NHS and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And can I say to members, there's a little time in hand for interventions at which you'll get your time back on. I now call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move Amendment 17011.2. Five minutes, Mr Thank Briggs. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Alison Johnson and the Green Party for bringing forward uh, this important debate today during their debating time. It was November in 2017 that the Parliament last had the opportunity to debate the GP crisis in Scotland when Scottish Conservatives brought forward our own debate and called at the time for 11% of funding to go direct to general practice. Since then, we have not seen progress in that becoming the reality. Now, over the Easter recess, I spent time in Highlands, Murray and Aberdeenshire meeting with rural GPs. The overwhelming message they gave me was that they feel the new GP contract is not working for them and that their concerns have not been listened to. Yes, very briefly. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way, and I do accept his point that uh, rural GPs face particular challenges. Would he also accept that the depend GPs who deal with the 100 most deprived areas also face big challenges? Miles Briggs. Absolutely. I was just coming to that. And I think this is where the government's been um, amazing in being able to unite both sets, because I know deep end GPs are equally not happy uh, with the contract as well. And despite being responsible for delivering the vast majority of patient contact within our health service, general practice in Scotland continues to face understandable and considerable underinvestment, uh, falling since uh, uh, its 9.8% share in 2005. The latest figures show that general practice in Scotland receives just 7.35% of Scottish NHS funding, falling well behind the average funding of general practice across the UK, which now stands at 8.88%. Now, we're only able to boost GP workforce by significantly investing in general practice, ensuring, as Alison Johnson said, that manageable workload levels can actually be put in place. A serious funding deficit exists for general practice. That's something which I think the government need to recognise, without which general practice cannot fulfil its potential and achieve the goals which all of us want to see it, it, it achieve. In the face of over a decade now of consistent cuts to the percentage share of NHS Scotland spending being made available to provide general practice with these services, RCGP has been calling consistently now for 11% of the annual budget of the Scottish NHS to be delivered in general practice. And as the briefing for today's debate makes clear, the funding gap in general practice is unsustainable. And action should be taken urgently to preserve patient safety by resourcing general practice with 11% of the budget. There perhaps never been a greater need for clarification in Scotland on the funding for general practice and the role and capacity of wider multidisciplinary teams. And I think there's a great potential if we do fund general practice pop properly. And as the RCGP briefing points out, new roles in general practice, support for practices, teaching and training development opportunities, digitally enabling care across our communities. This is what we should all be looking to try to deliver. From the outset, Scottish Conservatives have raised concerns regarding the new GP contract with the former Health Secretary and with the new Health Secretary and the un unintended consequences um, which it will have on rural GPs. And the truth is that when general practice works well, our National Health Service works well. And that's something we should all bear in mind and look towards and nothing more around that than recruitment towards general practice. Now, for the last 12 years, SNP ministers have launched several schemes to try to recruit to general practice. Um, the SNP created the programme in 2015 that aimed to take forward proposals to increase the number of medical students choosing to go into GP training, as well as encouraging them uh, into rural practice and economically deprived uh, areas. However, we've only seen recruitment of 18 GPs in two years at a cost of £2.5 million. That is simply not good enough and is continuing to fail our communities. 
GPs in particular have serious concerns about the proposals within the future contract, and that's something which my amendment looks towards. Phase two of this uh, GP contract must be cross-party, and we must have an opportunity to highlight these concerns and get this right, especially as we face an election year. And the Rural GP Association have already uh, put these, uh, uh, these concerns to the Cabinet Secretary, I know. For some time now, it's been clear that SNP ministers have not truly understood the crisis facing general practice across Scotland, especially in our rural communities. As I said almost two years ago, it's important that we now look and take time to get this right. Parliament can send a message and a united message to ministers tonight that we, they need to take urgent action on general practice and funding in Scotland and do far more than they are currently doing to prevent this crisis growing even further. Until the government fundamentally addresses the complaints and concer concerns which GPs are putting to, to all of us in this chamber, then general practice will not be able to flourish in Scotland. I move amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Monica Lennon to speak to move amendment 17011.1. Ms Lennon, five minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I believe that all of us appreciate the hardworking staff who work in our NHS, and because we do, it's incumbent on all of us to address Scotland's GP recruitment and retention challenges. So I'm grateful to Alison Johnson for bringing this debate forward today, but I'm also grateful to the Royal College of GPs and the BMA for their briefings ahead of the debate, but also for the many members of the public who get in touch, not just with me, but my colleagues and, and all of us, to share their views and experiences. Um, it is right in these debates that we show appreciation, but at the end of the day, it's, it's action that counts. And the role of general practice in our NHS cannot be overstated. It's on the front line of healthcare, carrying out the majority of patient contact, and it acts as a gatekeeper to other parts of our health service. GPs dedicate their working lives to the health and well-being of others. This is an admirable, admirable commitment, but whether NHS um, facing crisis is also a challenging one and increasingly so GPs tell us that they are under unprecedented pressure amidst GP shortages. We have GPs facing increasing levels of stress and burnout and that should worry all of us. So the evidence that GP recruitment is in crisis is clear and it is mounting and I have to say there has been a, a, a failing on the part of the Scottish Government to, to address workforce planning properly. Steps to remedy these challenges are welcome and we know that change will not happen overnight but in the meantime it's GPs and their patients who are paying the price. In the last three years over 200 doctors chose to leave general practice um, due to significant workload pressures. It's a hard sad fact to accept that our valued GPs feel this way and the bottom line is that Scotland cannot afford for this to continue. Out of hours, GPs provide an invaluable service in all of our communities and that has the potential to ease a pressure on A&E departments. But cuts to out of hours services and a shortage of GPs means more people have to take themselves to A&E &E, and it puts more pressure on the service. Hospitals and medical centres in Glasgow were left without staff covering emergency out of hours GP services more than 200 times last year. Easter House, which faces high levels of, of deprivation, faced a shocking 977% increase in the number of shifts that weren't covered. Um, before 2017, there were no examples of shifts being left unstaffed in Glasgow. So these figures um, no, do require further scrutiny and, and attention. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I'm not about to disagree with the member about the challenges we face in our out of hours service, but will she recognise that it was in fact the 2004 GP contract, not one negotiated by this government, that removed the requirement on GPs to provide out of hours services and that what we now have to have is the voluntary participation of GPs in those services and that as GPs retire, um, many of those, as a member said earlier, many of the newer ones want a different kind of work-life balance. And so we're seeing fewer GPs volunteering for out of our services, and we need to think differently about how we provide those. Uh, Ms Lennar, we'll give you your time back. 
I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, for that input and commentary, but I don't think it really cuts it when we have people in Easter House and really deprived parts of Glasgow who are wondering why they had out of hours access before 2017 and then have these problems now. We have to deal with 2019 Cabinet Secretary and we've heard from my colleague Neil Findlay about the challenges his constituents face in, in Stonyburn. But the, 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 G, the GP contract introduced last year was meant to ensure that GP recruitment and retention problems were alleviated. Implementation has been criticised and it has been slow and the BMA, we hear their call for an increased pace of change. Um, the Scottish Government has had some difficulty around um, rural GPs and we know that last month Dr Hogg, Vice Chair of the Rural GP Association, walked away from the Scottish Government's task force due to a lack of progress saying it's fallen by the wayside. Again, another cause for concern. So I think I welcome some of the action that the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, but we need to see promises being delivered on, um, and that's not always been the case under this administration. The Scottish Labour Party supports the Scottish Green uh, Party motion, and we can support the Scottish Conservative Party in motion two, but we, amendment two, but we can't support the Scottish Government amendment because we don't believe that the Scottish Government has adequately addressed the concerns of rural GPs, and also because it fails to acknowledge the serious issues with GP um, recruitment. In conclusion, presiding officer, we must value and support GPs right across Scotland because a robust, well-resourced GP service will ease pressures on other parts of the NHS and ultimately provide people in Scotland with a better health service. We all need to value GPs and look out for their health and well-being. We can't have GPs experiencing burnout. Um, and uh, I think you gave me a little bit more time, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll finish now, presenting Officer. We are highly concerned about the increasing problems out of our GP provision across Scotland and the particular challenges in our rural communities. For these reasons, we call for any review of GP resources to include a specific reference or focus on out of hours coverage and rural service provision. And on that note, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I call Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Cole Hamilton, four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the Greens for securing time for today's debate? It's not something we discuss enough in this, dis uh, in this place, but it is a matter of great importance. I was appointed as health spokesperson for my party on my second day in this place, and within hours I became aware of the, the breadth and depth of this crisis. GPs are often our first port of call, but very often the last consideration we give in this place, and, and that has to change. To give a, an understanding of the metrics around the breadth of that crisis, we know that by the end of this decade we will maybe have as many as 800 fewer GPs than we require as a country. A freedom of information request by my party revealed the depth of the recruitment crisis, that in Forth Valley alone there is a post which has gone unfilled for the last two years, that on Shetland there is a position that has been advertised eight times with only one application, and in Dunfries and Galloway a 22-month wait for another post to be filled. These stories are replicated the country over, and there are many, many reasons for that. In my constituency of West Edinburgh, we have not had a new doctor's surgery established for 45 years despite a year-on-year -year proliferation of new homes and populace within that. All of the GP surgeries in my communities are on their knees. Some have had to restrict their lists or close them entirely. That's down to the fact that the proliferation of housing development that happens in my constituency has no consideration of who will treat those patients. There are developments on stream right now for thousands upon thousands of new homes with no thought as to who those patients will turn to when they fall ill. We're not promoting general practice throughout the, the progress of our, our medical students as they go through their degrees. We're not recognising the pressures that we could alleviate very easily in general practice right now. The fact, and it's a subject I've raised time and time again, that one quarter of all appointments made to our GPs are done so due to an underlying mental health condition where those GPs are ill-equipped or do not have the time to bottom out the psychological reasons for that uh, that appointment being made in the first place. We know that there are workforce planning problems. It takes seven years to train a GP, but workforce planning cycles in Scotland happen only every five. And that in turn uh, leads to a problem of attrition where we, we fail to see 
when we're not planning effectively for the retiring cohorts of GPs and backfilling those places for new GPs to come up the ranks. And I think that retired GPs actually perform uh, some of the solution or offer part of the solution. We ha I've had visited in my constituency surgery retired GPs who said that they would be very happy to undertake one or two sessions a week if it was made easier for them to come back into general practice if they could keep their hand in far easier. I think we need to box clever and listen to the goodwill that exists in our general practitioners who have retired. I do commend the government for the new contract. I think there are aspects of it which have uh, proven to be quite elegant and well received by the community. The issue around premises, I think, it was a particular millstone around new entrants to partnership within general practice. The idea that people had have to take on a mortgage of £80,000 just to become a partner in a GP surgery was an inhibiting factor on so many. And I think the solution the government had, have offered, along with uh, the BMA and the RCGP, in addressing that is very elegant. But there are issues around the contract to that I think we will only see begin to bite as phase two comes in at the start of the next parliamentary session and that is particularly around the issues of financial compensation or recompense for uh, GPs in areas of profound rurality which is presiding officer those areas that are struggling as I said at the, the top of my remarks to recruit GPs first and foremost I said at the start that GPs are the first port of call for many of our constituents when they fall ill but they're all too often our last consideration in this place and that needs to change thank you thank you very much now move to the open debate speeches of four minutes that will be mark ruskell followed by emma harper mr ruskell please thank you <coughs> deputy presiding officer um, it's clear from comments from members already in this debate that the gp crisis continues to have a big impact across scotland and just this week the dunfermline Rep press reporting on a local father who had to phone his surgery over 100 times in just one morning to try and get an appointment. But of course, it's not just primary care services that have been impacted by the GP shortage. The delivery of out-of-hours care has been limited by a lack of GPs and also the contractual changes that have taken place over a number of years. Now, in my own region, there have been two NHS boards carrying out major service changes to out-of-hours primary care. That's Fourth Valley and Fife. And their approach has been very different, however, and there are serious lessons to be learned for other NHS boards. In 2017, Fourth Valley NHS implemented interim measures, concentrating their out-of-hours service in one location at the Fourth Valley Royal Hospital in Larbert. Now, understandably, this caused concern and disruption for many people, especially for those in rural Stirling who are facing journeys of up to 40 miles to access these services. But on the back of this, NHS Fourth Valley instigated a recruitment drive for a significant team of allied health professionals to complement and support GP provision, including out of hours. Earlier this year, 80 new advanced nurse practitioners, prescribing pharmacists and paramedics and other health professionals joined the NHS Fourth Valley team, the first of over 200 new staff who will deliver a multidisciplinary model of primary and out of hours care at locations across the area. But I would emphasize that this is a model though which is, continues to be led by GPs. It's important that GPs display strong leadership and are supported by these multidisciplinary teams which they support in turn themselves. Now in contrast, NHS Fife implemented emergency out of hours provision last year, limiting services to just two locations in Dunfermline and Kirkcaldy. And this was followed by a consultation which proposed a very limited set of options and no discussion about the role of GP-led multidisciplinary teams. Now, it's taken communities to put in two participation requests under the community empowerment legislation and a whole new series of consultation workshops for a new option to develop in Fife, which uses the same multidisciplinary model Fourth Valley and other NHS boards have been proactively adopting. The latest proposals that have come out of this participation will retain an evening and weekend service at St Andrews Community Hospital using a mixture of GPs and health professionals with home visits to the most vulnerable and remote patients. And work is ongoing to ho hopefully design a similar model for Glenrothes. But I have serious concerns at the ability to deliver an effective multidisciplinary model with the current staffing levels in Fife. There's been no recruitment drive comparable to that in the Fourth Valley with only five urgent care <laughs> practitioners and 5.4 advanced nurse practitioners currently in the training pipeline. 
10 and a half star for Fife versus 300 for Fourth Valley. <laughs> this is a very worrying difference in our workforce planning. And I'm deeply concerned that it will put our GPs in Fife under further pressure. Meanwhile, what was supposed to be a temporary centralization of services in Kakodi has continued now for over a year with no date set yet for a new model to roll out. Now, I've raised this issue in the chamber before and was heartened by the response from the cabinet secretary that there is specialist funding available for training advanced nurse practitioners and prescribing pharmacists. And as the motion states today, we urgently need a review of GP recruitment resources and funding, including the allied health professionals that are so vital to delivering a successful multidisciplinary model for primary care. These models are popular. Patients report high satisfaction levels, and there are communities like Bridge of Earn in my region who are actively lobbying their local health boards to see multidisciplinary health and well-being centers built in their communities. But the inconsistency and lack of staff recruitment across certain NHS boards needs addressing right now. Emma Harper, followed by Annie Wales. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate, both as a nurse with over 30 years of experience and as Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee here in Parliament. The new GP contract for Scotland, which came into force in April 2018, aims to help cut doctors' workload, ensure a minimum income guarantee for GPs and allows general practice to become a more attractive career. The contract is still in its infancy and we are now embarking on year two of its implementation. In 2018-19, the Scottish Government invested over £110 million in support of the new GP contract and wider primary care reform, all of which is extremely welcome. Last year, I attended the Royal College of GPs annual conference in Glasgow and I was able to speak to GPs, including Dr Carrie Lunan, who is the RCGP lead in Scotland, and I got to hear firsthand from them about how they thought the contract would work. And there is some apprehension around whether the contract will work completely for rural GPs. And following these con conversations and after discussions with former colleagues in the primary care sector, I wrote to all the GP practices across NHS and Freeson Galloway area asking for feedback on the contract and if there were any other issues that they wanted to bring up with me, which I could then relay back to the Scottish Government. And I'm pleased that today I've had over six practices respond and I'm in the process of meeting with them to listen and hear their thoughts about having uh, processes that we can further improve with the contract. And last week I met with the Charlotte Street practice in De Vries. And at the meeting, it was clear to me that the GPs agreed with much of what the contract has to offer, but they did make it clear that they had concerns over some of the timescales for what some of the contract states. For example, the length of time it might take to implement the pharmacists into practices, or pharmacists into practices. I was able to make, uh, it was clearly made from the GPs that I met, both at the conference and from the GPs locally, that the, the way many believe we should be recruiting GPs, per, particularly to rural areas, such as in the southwest, in my Scot South Scotland region, is by improving transport infrastructure, both road and rail. And I'm sorry, but like this Harper's harping on again about the A75, 76 and 77. But the GPs did say that uh, if people who may have studied, lived, and their families are maybe in the central belt, but if they could have easy access to Dumfries and Galloway and Stranraer and all the places in between by fast tr train links or road links, that they may be more inclined to work in Bonnie Galloway. So, presiding officer, I'm aware that the Scottish Government is actively working on recruiting and indeed retaining our GPs, and just in 2018-19, the Government invested £7.5 million in this, which included £850,000 for remote and rural areas. And for all the 160 remote and rural practices, the Scottish Government has made available golden hello payments to GPs taking up their first post in a rural practice and relocation packages of up to £5,000. GP recruitment concerns are not unique to Scotland. However, this government's commitment, including expanding the remote and rural incentive scheme and relocation funds, should have a real impact going forward. And this investment of 7.5 million has allowed the Scottish Government to invest in the Scott Gem programme, which will benefit Dumfries and Galloway in my South Scotland region. Scott Gem, which is a partnership between St Andrews University, Dundee University and NHS Scotland, is a course orientated towards the current NHS Scotland workforce requirements, particularly in remote and rural GP practice. 
55 students in total were matriculated with St Andrews University in August 2018. And I'm pleased that the first group of second year students will arrive in Dumfries and Galloway in August this year. Happily, five GP practices across Dumfries and Galloway are set to take part in the pilot year of the project. And I look forward to seeing its outcomes. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to thank the exceptional specialist GPs across Scotland, and I welcome the positive steps being taken by the Scottish Government to help with the recruitment and retention of GPs. Annie Wells, followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. General practice is the front line of the NHS, and it has been seriously let down by the SNP. After nearly 12 years in charge of Scotland's health service, the issue we have with GP recruitment and retention is only getting worse. We know that this has been a long-standing issue, which the SNP have been repeatedly warned. Demand on the health service is growing with the role of GP <coughs> excuse me, becoming more important. As the Royal College of GPs points out, general practice is at the front line of the NHS, carrying out the vast majority of the patient contacts. GPs act as gamekeepers to the entire NHS. Me. <coughs> Despite this, however, the Royal College of GPs has estimated that there will be a shortfall of 856 GPs by 2021. More than 500 GPs have taken early retirement since the SNP came into power, with the number of doctors in training in Scotland having sunk to a five-year low. The Scottish Government has highlighted the measures it has taken to combat this crisis, and whilst I welcome schemes like ScotGem, <clears throat> yes. Jean Freeman. The evidence she has for that assertion that the numbers of doctors in training has sunk to a five-year low because those are not the figures I'm working with. Annie Wells. Well, I will um, send the figures over to the health minister. Yes, I will. The Scottish Government has highlighted the measure that's taken to combat the crisis. And whilst I welcome schemes like ScotGem, it's concerning that it's taken so many years to reach this point, even more so given that the BMA warned of severe shortages of GPs in 2008. And when it comes to retention, talks over the new GP contract between the SNP government and rural GPs have revealed ongoing tensions. The contract is still widely opposed by rural doctors who state due to its focus on workload, unfairly benefits practices in wealthy urban areas with large elderly populations. And only last month, <clears throat> we saw Dr David Hogg, Vice Chair of the Rur Rural GP Association of Scotland, resign from a working group set up by the Scottish Government. This was because of what he saw as a failure to suggest any pragmatic and realistic proposals to counteract the impact the contract would have on rural services. And the Scottish Conservatives have repeatedly made calls to try and counteract the problems general practice is facing. We have called on the SNP to spend more of the NHS budget on GP frontline to meet the 11% target. And our Save Our Surgeries campaign makes clear the importance of properly funding general practice. And as we've heard, in recent years, Scotland's general practice continues to face considerable underinvestment, falling from its 9.8 share in 2005-06 and the latest figures show that the general practice in Scotland received just 7.35% of Scottish NHS funding, this being the lowest share of NHS spend in the UK. This additional funding would equip general practice to future, would allow general practice for the future, allowing surgeries to invest more and in improved IT systems, helping GPs and patients save time and resources. It would also allow surgeries to modernise becoming fit for purpose buildings and act like community hubs, where social prescribing becomes the norm. In addition to this, the Scottish Conservatives have also called for more medical school places to be made available to Scottish-based students and for GPs to be given more time for appointments from 10 to 15 minutes to assist with patients' more complex needs. And only by properly front funding general practice can these changes be made. And to finish today, I would like to reiterate our calls for the SNP to spend more of its NHS budget on the GP frontline. At a time when demand on the health service is greater than ever, it is so vitally important that general practice receive the correct level of funding. Action is the gateway to the entire NHS. General practice is in dire need of our support. Thank you. 
Neil Finlay, followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, general practice and the relationship that patients have with their doctor uh, is key to the way our NHS operates and, of course, to the trust that we place in it. People, uh, including me, have great respect and indeed great deference towards their doctor and anything that negatively impacts on uh, general practice ripples throughout the rest of the NHS, resulting in more and longer delays at A&E. Uh, treatment time guarantees being breached, delayed discharge, more pressure on staff, fewer students entering general practice, and greater reliance on locums, costing the NHS more, fewer appointment times, closed lists, and ultimately poorer patient care. All of this, all of this is happening in Scotland today. General practice is therefore crucial to our NHS, the wider NHS, and it has been failed by poor planning, finance, financing, and mismanagement at a governmental level. Over the last decade, we see falling numbers entering uh, GP training uh, down to around 300. The Royal College say we are 850 short, 850 short. Uh, two years ago, I held a drop-in session over the summer for GPs in my area. All of them, I spoke to 14 different practices, all of them raised with me the crisis in recruitment. It's now worse than it was then. Some of them said they were a resignation away from closure. These are well-established, long-established practices sitting in communities where doctors are highly valued. Others were completely reliant on locum GPs just to keep the doors open. open. Locums who across Scotland are claiming up to 14 hundred pounds a day and in Lothian over 500 a day. Uh, we also in Lothian see around 50 practices operating restrictions on their waiting list. Cabinet Secretary, this is not good enough. A quarter of practices report vacancies. A third who advertise see it takes six months to try and fill posts. Uh, only last week, we had NHS Lothian announce that in May coming, nine out of 23 days cannot be covered at the St John's out of hours GP service because of staff shortages. So, having, so have, if you want to intervene, by all means. Jane Freeman. But will the member accept, as I made the point to Ms Lennon, that the reason why there are these out challenges in out of our services is the 2004 GP contract, not negotiated by this, it's, it's not all come on, it is the case, ask the BMA, ask the Royal College, ask Sir Lewis Ritchie, they will all point to that and the removal of the requirement of GPs. Um, Mr to Finlay, I'll give you extra time. The removal of the requirement of GPs to undertake out-of-hours services. That, plus the cohort ageing and retiring, combines to produce that problem. So rather than rehearse the problem, where are Labour's solutions to this? I'm still waiting. You have been in power since 2007, and now you're only getting round to addressing it. I don't think you'll get away with that one, Minister. So having just had six years... Six years where the NHS couldn't staff the children's ward in my local hospital. We're now told they cannot staff the out-of-hours GP service. I don't know what you find amusing, Minister, because it was six years that went, you went through that turmoil with three different closures. Go and have a look at the record, Minister. And patients in the current situation with the closure of the out-of-hours GP service are being advised to contact NHS 24. Cabinet Secretary, this is not good enough. This will impact on patient care, which will be compromised. And, President Officer, I've raised several times the situation, as I mentioned earlier, at Stonyburn Health Centre. The community has had a GP since the very creation of the NHS in 1948. It no longer has a GP, thanks to the crisis under this government's watch. What a proud achievement that must be for you, Cabinet Secretary. The elderly, the unemployed, the disabled and low paid now have to use a very poor public transport system to travel for appointments. For a young mum with two children, 
This is at the minimum cost of almost seven pounds. Previously, she would have been able to walk up the street to her local surgery. So Cabinet close, Secretary, please. what do you say to the young mum who came to me to say she struggled to take her children to the doctor because of the cost? That is the health service of the 19th century, not the 21st century. The last of the open debate contributions from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. I want to begin this afternoon, President Officer, by reflecting on the general state of the National Health Service in Scotland. I would suggest that we have a health service to be proud of. During the course of me joining this place in 2011, the NHS budget has gone up, gone up from £10 billion to over £13 billion. Pounds. And unlike those who like to complain, particularly in this chamber, we get on with the day job and resolve the issues through local health boards, not in the chamber. I like, no, I have no time. I like many others in this chamber, get constituents coming to my surgery with health inquiries, which we actually resolve. We actually resolve. Yes, we any organisation, there'll be a delay in complaints, but it's solving each and every complaint that gives me a satisfaction of doing what I do for constituents. That's what we do, sorry, don't have any time. The health service has to cope with many issues, too numerous to mention in the time that I have available. I believe the health service deserves more credit than what it gets, and I regularly contact my local GPs when required. I get annoyed because time and time again we see political criticism of our health service in this chamber rather than trying local resolution at local level through health boards. Some of the main parties opposite maximise their opportunity to take a pop at the government, no time, or a cabinet secretary. The SNP has the most significant investment plans in the SHS. No, I don't have time. The lack of answers by the people opposite include the issue of recruitment and retention of GPs in Scotland, presiding officer, which we are discussing today. I value each and every GP that we have. As a part-time job, I personally had the good fortune to be an out-of-hours driver for NHS 24 before I came to this place. Driving a doctor to a house call, seeing at first hand how they cope with health needs of the population. Working at night and weekends. Yes, I saw at first hand the work the GPs do and also the work that goes in our, our local hospitals. Presiding officer, to be clear, the SNP greatly values the contribution that GP profession makes to the, health, the nation's health. And this is a government that I'm sure wants to make sure that they have the support that they need. That's why the new GP contract for Scotland, which only came into force in April 20, uh, 2018, helps to cut doctors' workload, ensures the minimum income guarantee for GPs, and makes general practice an even more career, uh, attractive career. The BMA in their briefing state there has been considerable progress over recent times. Indeed, we're now embarking on year two of implementing the new contract. Figures from 2018-19 show that the Scottish Government invested over £110 million in support of the new GB contract and wider primary care reform. In fact, a comment by Dr Andrew Bust, Chair of BMA Scotland's Scottish General Practitioners Committee was at the heart of the new GP contract introduced last year was a clear aim to make become a GP a more attractive career choice and encourage more people into working in this part of the profession. That's absolutely correct. And the commitment is matched by this Scottish Government announcement of G for announcements for GP premises accessing loan funding of £50 million through a GP premises loan scheme over the next three years. GP premises, a sustainable loan scheme is in direct response to concerns raised with the BMA and aims to ease the financial burden associated with while owning a practice, in turn helping to improve recruitment and retention. It means GPs who own their own premises can apply for long interest, uh, uh, interest loans, free loans worth up to 20% of the practice value. The scheme reduces the risk of premise, the premises ownership, sometimes raised a common concern among GPs. It's part of a move towards GPs no longer being required to own a property. A total of 172 practices have successfully applied for loans, around 50% of the total eligible. And I'm delighted that a number of them are featured, that are featured are in 
Uddingston and Belsall, and indeed across Lanarkshire. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government have committed to recruit 800 GPs over the next decade. Indeed, by the end of this Parliament, the Scottish Government will be investing an additional 500 million in primary care. I believe in ending. I believe that this SNP Government has a record to be proud of, and the political parties opposite should stop car carping for the sidelines. We move to the closing speeches. I have no spare time left at all. So, David Stewart, up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I also uh, congratulate Alison Johnston and the Green Party for securing this afternoon's important debate on Scotland's GP recruitment and retention uh, challenges. In my view, it's been a well-informed and insightful debate about the crucial players in our primary care delivery, our GPs. And as the BMA rightly argue, problems with GP recruitment and retention are, of course, deep-seated issues, and there's no quick fix. Of course, current surveys of GPs have shown around one in four practices have reported vacancies. Now, many members, including uh, Neil Finlay, Miles Briggs, Monica Lennon, Alec Cole Hamilton, uh, Mark Ruskell and Annie Wells, argued uh, that increased workloads were certainly to blame for some of these uh, GP uh, vacancies. Now, excessive workloads are cited by GPs as a major reason why some are leaving the profession and, equally importantly, not entering it in the first place. In the 2018 BMA survey, over 70% of GP partners said they worked substantially more hours per week beyond the opening times of the surgery. In addition, President Officer, many members spoke of the risks associated with working as a GP, such as owning the practice premises and employing staff. And in fairness, uh, the GP Premises Sustainability Fund, which is intended to make uh, uh, general practice more workable, is a good concept and designed to reduce the risks uh, that practice partners are exposed to. How, if it's very brief, because I'm quite tight for time. John Finney. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. But would the member recognise that there's a place, as has happened in our constituency, for the use of salaried GPs? David Stewart. Yes, I think that is an important part of the model, and I visit some of these myself in Wick uh, and in Thurso. However, uh, President Officer, I've also raised my concerns at the Health and Sport Committee about the increase in employer contributions for pensions by 6% this month uh, for GPs. And this is caused, which I've no time to debate, this is caused by a technical issue, which is a change in the current discount rate. Now, this will hit GPs and GP practices and may result in redundancies for GP staff. Now, this, of course, is a reserved issue, uh, and I hope that the Scottish Government will get the full funding from the UK Exchequer about this issue. There's also wider pension issues, like lifetime allowance, which particularly affects the retention of GPs, uh, uh, particularly those who are aged over uh, 55. And another key element in recruitment and retention of GPs, as we've heard, is the effect of the new contract in remote uh, and rural areas. Uh, this was referred to in the debate and, and is also in our amendment. Uh, D Dr David Hogg, who's the Vice Chairman of the Rural Group GPs Association, resigned from the Scottish Government Working Group month, last month as he said, Rural Group GPs, and I quote, are despondent about the new contract. Concerns were raised about the new funding formula that's based on number of appointments but fails to recognise the challenges faced uh, by rural GPs of often uh, to travel much longer distances, of course, to patients uh, and to practices. So in conclusion, uh, President Officer, uh, the GPs are a crucial linchpin of the NHS, delivering services in the community and reducing pressures on acute and emergency services. I believe we have a workforce crisis in the NHS and as we've heard from many speakers like Alec Cole Hamilton, we're facing a shortage of 850 GPs over the next 10 years. So out of our services uh, are vital for ensuring that access uh, to urgent care in the community is there when needed. But we've seen cuts in also in out of our services across Scotland. But the big picture, of course, and we know the reasons for this, for uh, loss of GPs is demographic changes, the demands of rural areas and the social economic challenges uh, of the disadvantaged communities across Scotland. Whilst there's no quick fix, Scottish Labour support the Royal College of GPs call to increase the proportion of NHS spending allocated specifically to general practice to 11% in order to grow and maintain the workforce and fully support the highest possible standard of patient care. And as Nye Bevan famously said, the NHS I will last as long as there's folk left with fake to fight it. Thank you. <laughs> Brian Whittle, absolutely no more than four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I add my thanks to Alison Johnson and the Green Party for bringing this debate to the Chamber. 
and giving us the chance to discuss an issue that the public are really concerned about. I wish we had more time uh, to explore this. Uh, I think it deserves it. I think this is a debate, uh, Deputy Spending Officer, that has been well rehearsed in this place, and we all know the numbers, and as many members have stated, we are heading towards a shortage of greater than 100, 850 GPs. And after this, is, I'm glad that Emma Harper is sitting down because it's not like me, but I am going to say well done to her for getting the A77, A75 and rail infrastructure into her speech. Uh, I think that it's important because the environment uh, does have an effect on where people work. So uh, I, I think we've been talking about recruitment and retention, but in my view, we've got that the wrong way around. I think it should be retention and recruitment. It's much more difficult to fill the bucket of water when it's full of holes. And we know that more than 500 GPs have taken early retirement since 2007. And we also know that a third of GPs are age 50 or over, as, as Alison Johnson uh, said in her speech. So it, would it not make more sense to ensure we create an environment where our healthcare professionals can deliver the care they are trained to do in the manner they would like to, being cognizant of their need to have that opportunity to have that uh, healthy lifestyle. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we should be looking to retain the experience that resides within our GP numbers while we look to backfill the shortage. And this is made uh, on more relevant given the BMA reporting that pressures on our GPs is increasing and their mental health uh, is in decline. I think what, we, what Annie Wells uh, mentioned, I think, was that GPs need more time in which to, to uh, deliver the, the service that they can. And this shortage has been highlighted, I have to say, consistently to the Scottish Government by various experts, including uh, the Royal uh, uh, College of GPs. Over a number of years, I think it was in, uh, all the way back into 2008, the BMA said that a workforce crisis was imminent with too few GPs being trained to replace those uh, who are retiring or leaving. So we shouldn't be surprised at that. But in, meanwhile, during this time, I think the Indigenous medical students in our medical schools, uh, the percentage has dropped dramatically. And I think it's reasonable to assume that the place in which a qualified medical practice is more likely to relate to the address on the UCAS form. And I think listening to, to Richard Lyle there, I used, I used to listen to him in the Health and Sport Committee mention this very point that, that his young constituents couldn't access medical places in medical school. Um, I think, how can I say, in conclusion, 11% uh, of the total health budget going directly to general practice should be the very minimum target, especially um, uh, given the drive towards community-based health delivering and away from an acute setting. I think the, the, uh, the RCPG did, uh, have said they've, they've expressed concerns about the lack of clarity, I have to say, over the government's commitment to invest 500 million in primary care and warned that if the long-standing underfunding and confusion that we currently experience is to continue, we will keep witnessing a considerable number of general practices closing. And that, that has been expressed, um, Neil Finlay expressed his issues around his constituency. In East Ayrshire, Fenwick has closed. There's a, there's, a, there's a surgery in Troon that's closed in South Ayrshire. So I, th I think we, we can't deny that there is an issue here. And I think the solution's not an easy one, uh, and it will take time. I think it's a multifaceted response required, including student places, especially for Scottish students. And we need to review that. I think a, re a review of the GP contract Given its unpopularity in the rural GP community, we must accept that. And that's been highlighted by a number of members around this chamber, including Alex Cole Hamilton and Miles Big and Monica Lennon. I think technology will uh, play an, inevitably play a major role in the development of a solution, which is for another time. So uh, I think the, the GP motion is an obvious first uh, a step in addressing the current crisis. So we will be supporting that motion. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, I call Jean Freeman for up to five minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by uh, thanking members for the contribution of the debate, but can I also particularly th start with uh, Mr Whittle uh, for uh, the recognition, very welcome recognition in my mind uh, from him that this is a multifaceted issue that will require that kind of multifaceted response. And also, can I also make clear that I understand completely that there are key challenges in terms of the contract and how it is interpreted and understood, phase one of the contract, in addressing some of the issues that some GPs from rural practices are raising with us. And I have committed, I hope I made that clear in my opening statement, that we will look uh, specifically at that and that that is what we have asked the group uh, the chaired by Sir Lewis Ritchie to specifically look at. And I hope that we will make quick progress 
uh, on some of those key issues. And we will then look at phase two of the GP contract when we begin those negotiations informed by Sir Lewis Ritchie's uh, working group's conclusions, but those discussions with the BMA, uh, what more we may do. And of course, that begins very shortly. Can I also uh, thank Alison Johnson, not only for bringing the debate to the Chamber, but for raising the question of the national conversation, uh, an issue that was raised, has been raised by, uh, with me directly by the RCGP, raised with me uh, by Emma Harper, and uh, uh, confirm to members that we are now actively working with the RCGP to look at how we will take that national conversation forward in order to ensure that many more of our citizens understand the positive changes uh, that are brought by the GP contract for sure, but also by the changes we're making to primary care and the reform there, which in some instances, uh, as the uh, uh, recent journal, BJGP journal, reported uh, over a two-year period show a positive increase in patient satisfaction. Now, that is not to deny that there are areas where there are difficulties, but there are uh, areas where we are seeing the improvement of that. The national conversation should help us significantly. I don't believe there is any basis for saying that we in government, that I don't understand the challenges facing GPs. Uh, and GP practice. That's not the BMA's view. And while funding alone won't get us uh, past uh, some of those challenges or overcome the time it takes to train uh, and then to recruit, indeed to produce GPs, I hope members will accept that our commitment as a government to increase investment in primary care by 500 million over the lifetime of this parliament will take spending in primary care to at least 1.28 billion pounds. That's 11% of the frontline NHS budget. And that by 2021, uh, in a sec, more than half of frontline NHS spending will be in community health service. Yeah, please. Yeah. Alison Johnson. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, 250 million of the 500 million uh, that you've spoken about will be in direct support of general practice. Could I ask for some clarity about what the other 250 million pounds will be spent on? Jean Freeman. So that the rest of that funding is in all those other areas of primary care that I touched on in terms of the other disciplines, the other healthcare disciplines that are required to create that multidisciplinary team. The allied health professionals, the mental health uh, services, the uh, uh, health visitors and uh, district nurses and so on, all of whom combine to create the important multidisciplinary team that are a core part of primary care reform. Um, out of our uh, challenges are undoubtedly there. I, I need to say there's no use in any member in this chamber rehearsing those challenges for me when I understand them very well indeed. We are trying to address those in the context of the new GP contract. And the what I would like to be able to do is to address those on the basis of additional ideas to the work that we're undertaking that comes forward from colleagues across this chamber. Yes, I'm happy to take an intervention. No, you're just closing. Oh, I'm just closing. Secretary. No, I'm not happy. <laughs> two, two quick points. Um, I'm grateful to Emma Harper for uh, looking forward and I look forward to receiving the detail from the practices she's engaged with. I think Mark Ruskell made a very strong point comparing Forth Valley and Fife and I want to say to him, I will look further at this and that the recent review of integration authorities commits us and COSLA in the next 12 months to actively work to improve consistency. So yes, presiding officer, there are challenges, that we, but we have made significant progress. We've made progress in the commitment that we've made uh, to uh, increase GP numbers by 800. I hope members would recognize that. There are issues for us to address in some of our GP practices in remote and rural areas, but the principle in the contract of addressing workload is the right one. But it is clear that no services should transfer out of a GP practice unless it's safe and, uh, to do so, and that the locality decisions you are those close, most important please. decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Alison Johnson to wind up the debate for six minutes, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'd like to thank all members for their contributions to, de de to today's debate. Um, I'd also like to thank the RCGP and the BMA for those briefings and to those GPs from across Scotland who have contacted me after learning of this debate this afternoon. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has 
has uh, confirmed that she understands the issues and spoke about us rehearsing these issues in this chamber, but I think it's really important that GPs know that this parliament is listening to them. Um, uh, very briefly. Neil Finlay. Minister Sadia. Uh, Mr Finlay, your microphone's not on. Oh, sorry, oh Mr Finlay. <laughs> To raise the point that, that, that I was going to make with the Minister, does, does Alison Johnson agree that it is a duty of members of this Parliament to raise these issues time and time again, whether the Minister likes it or not? Alison Johnson. Absolutely, I agree wholeheartedly that that is our duty. Um, Monica Lennon and Miles Briggs raised concerns regarding the, the impact of the contract on particular GP groups, as did Emma Harper, and I think their engagement and action on behalf of GPs is clearly welcome. Um, Annie Wells spoke of the role of the GP as, as a gatekeeper and Neil Finlay spoke about the knock-on impact that having insufficient numbers of GPs has across the, F the NHS um, and he spoke of the, the many um, closures within the region of Lothian that both he and I represent but this is clearly a Scotland-wide issue. I think it's fair to say that Richard Lyle simply left us in no doubt at all that he is a loyal member of the governing party. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm also, I, I don't want to waste time here, but um, I think Emma Harper and Brian Whittle are becoming known as the E75 Appreciation Society in this chamber. Um, but I really do thank you all for your contributions. Um, my colleague Ross Greer, in, in his region, um, Barger and medical practice in Erskine, it was left with no permanent GPs mm -hmm. after the lead doctor resigned because recruitment issues had made his position unsustainable. He was the fourth GP to, to quit the practice in 18 months. We've heard about cases like this across Scotland in the chamber today. The number of GP practices in Scotland has decreased by 8% since 2008, and we all know the impact this is having on patients. Will your departing GP will be, re be replaced? Who will you see be seen by the next time you make an appointment? Will that practice have to close together? Has it already closed? The RCGB tell us that patients who receive continuity of care in general practice have better health outcomes, higher satisfaction rates, and the health care they receive is more cost effective because they've built a trusted relationship. Now they acknowledge that new methods of working, including multidisciplinary teams, are they're part of the solution for falling levels of continuity for those who need it most. But they need successful implementation as well as significant investment to produce more GPs. So the point I'm making, the expansion of the multidisciplinary team is welcome, but it's vital that GPs are available to work alongside other health practitioners. This is the holistic person-centred care that Scotland's people deserve. Now we've heard about the concerns of rural, rural GPs with regards to the contract. The Rural GP Association believes that it fails to take into account the workload and services provided in that rural setting. Um, their members in a, in a survey, 82% believed that the outlook for rural healthcare was worse under the contract. And a third of its members reported that they were anticipating that services would need to be curtailed. And there have also been concerns raised in the media you know, about the change in the way vaccinations are delivered in rural areas, that it might lead to a fall in immunisation as patients have to make longer journeys to attend special clinics rather than that local surgery. So there's the epitome of the fragmentation of care which might occur. Now, you know, these practices clearly operate differently from those in urban centres. But I do appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary has said she is in talks with the BMA about how to take account of those concerns in phase two of the contract. But 98% of Scotland is considered rural and a fifth of its population lives in a rural area. So this, this is urgent. Um, you know, as I've previously discussed in this chamber, there was once fierce competition for every GP position, several applicants for each post. But now it's the case that there are practices with no permanent GPs and increased GP training places aren't being filled as we need them to be. So we need to make general practice in Scotland an attractive career that really appeals to people and one to which GPs who've taken career breaks will return. The Health and Care Experience Survey I, I mentioned earlier reported that 83% of people rated the overall care provided by their GP practice positively. The service provided in our GP practices remains outstanding. And I'm sure we have no doubt at all that this is down to the efforts of our fantastic practice teams. So we should take every effort to promote the fact that general practice in Scotland is a challenging, competitive, worthwhile, rewarding career which will offer the opportunity to deliver excellence every day. But we live in a modern world. People desire more flexibility in their working patterns and general practice isn't immune to this. 
and there's a, a, an increasing number of GPs who are not working full weeks. Practices have worked on a small business model since the 60s, and that might be the preference of many GPs because more and more don't want to be partners. So new <coughs> ways of working could make being a GP a more attractive career to a, great, a greater number of people. So we should take care to promote the many different forms working in general practice can take. In closing, presiding officer, working with and listening to Scotland's health professionals will enable us to develop and deliver a healthcare model that will better support those working in the NHS, helping them to keep our growing and ageing population well. We need to listen to GPs when they tell us what will improve conditions and patient care. The need for 11% at least of NHS funding, whole time equivalent GPs in the sufficient numbers, targeted funding and a national please. conversation are all calls coming from the front line and I sincerely hope that the Cabinet Secretary will heed these messages and implement a review of GP recruitment, resources and funding as soon as possible. Thank you, President Officer. That concludes the debate on addressing Scotland's GP recruitment and retention challenges. It's time to move on to the next item of business. And whilst everyone is quickly shifting their seats, uh, can I say that by the time we're settled, there is absolutely no time at all spare in the next debate. And I may even have to cut time off some of the open debate speeches.